Uh, we did ministry together with the Young Adults Ministry. I was a ministry leader there on staff for Young Adults, and he was the pastor there. And then I moved over to being a ministry leader of small groups. And then I resigned to be able to be with our family a little bit more and just help our, our kids, especially you know, our youngest one, just navigate through life a little bit. But I have continued to serve there. Uh, they just know what my parameters are. They know what the boundaries are for me. And they've been amazing at just creating that opportunity for me to continue to serve. So I work with a lot of the interns over there. Um, if, you, if they intern at Water of Life over there, uh, chances are they're going to, I'm one of those people they're going to sit down with for mentoring or spiritual direction. Just helping them as young people set some good habits and really learn and understand who they are as they navigate those next stages of their life. And then I do train some of the small group leaders there and I just do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but it's really fun to be able to do that. And when I got the call about doing this, I was just through the roof excited that you guys would want to do something like this because one of the things that I have noticed in walking with people is that a lot of times there's not an understanding of how you have been put together how you were created, how you process things, how you internalize things, why you do the things you do, what is motivating you. And you kind of feel like you're on this hamster wheel and it's just going and it's going and you're not going anywhere. And I'm getting tired. How do I get off this hamster wheel? When there's, when there's an understanding of how we're put together, then we can start to actually gain some ground. And the fact that you guys want to be able to do this was absolutely exciting for me to be able to be a part of that. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak into you in that. Now, I am a mover. Just going to put that out there. I walk around quite a bit, so I'm going to try and situate myself here just a little bit. Um, so the Enneagram. I am actually not a fan of personality tests. And I know that's pretty ironic that I'm up here talking about that. And here's why. Because I have seen the damage that it can do. These, any, these tests, these personality tests come out and what happens is that either others or ourselves, we use it to put ourselves in a box or other put, people put, our, put us in a box and we put the label on and now you are this person and that doesn't give any kind of room for growth and maturing and experience and understanding. Anytime we have our interns take a personality test, I get on my soapbox and we talk about this and I tell them this is just a tool. It is just a tool. This does not replace scripture in any way. This is a tool. I have taken several tests over the course of my life and I can tell you that there have been shifts along the way. And I can also point out probably where those shifts came from. A lot of shifting happened even in my giftings when I started taking teams overseas. That's because I was able to come out of my comfort zone. And I was able to allow God to use me in a way that was completely out of my comfort zone. So I want to encourage all of us as we're going through this and you got your results. And can I just say, being able to sit here and hearing some of the conversations going on in the back about who are you? What are you? Oh my goodness, that's right. I just love that. I just, because it's such a good conversation to have. I just want to encourage you to, as you're looking at this, don't allow it to put you in a box. This is just an opportunity of growth to understand how you're crafted, to yes, look at the areas that we need to work on, but also embrace the blessing that comes with who you are. There are nine personality types that we're going to talk about. We need all nine of you. We need all nine of you. So we want to embrace what is good. Now, as we're going through this, we're going to really talk about some self-awareness. And I know self-awareness can be a bit of a trigger sometimes, and I want to speak to that. Self-awareness is not wrong. It's not being selfish, and it's not being self-centered. In our conversion experience, when we said yes to Jesus, we didn't say yes to Jesus just because we became aware of Jesus. We said yes to Jesus because we became self-aware of our need of a Lord and Savior. Right? So it's not bad. It is okay for us to have this self-awareness. The Enneagram 
is a little different in terms of that it really speaks to relationship, how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to the world around us. Well, what does scripture say about relationship? If you look at Matthew chapter 22, it talks about these two commandments. And the first one is that we are to love our God. That's our relationship with God. How are we to love God? Right, with all it's three aspects. That, to the wholeness of ourselves is how we are to love God. And then it goes to the second commandment, which is just as important as the first commandment, and that is that we are to love our neighbor. We are to, lo we are to love others. How are we to love others? As ourselves. As we love ourselves. It keeps coming back to self. So this is a relationship with God. This is a relationship with others. It's also a relationship with ourselves. How do I love myself? How do I understand who I am? Why has this been a little bit of a struggle? And I honestly feel like we're starting to turn the corner a lot when it comes to this in the, in the church. And I'm really excited that we're going to be able to now look at this through a biblical perspective. But this has been a struggle from the beginning of time. You have the story of Genesis, right? And you have where Adam and Eve were able to go through the garden, that everything was perfect, and God tells Adam that you can have everything here except for this one tree. Eve is there by the tree. Satan does what he does best. He mixes a little bit of truth and some lies. She tries to dialogue and debate this. She ends up falling for it. She takes the fruit. She gives it to her husband who was standing next to him. He eats the fruit. Sin comes into the world. Sin came in through one man and it had to be dealt with through the man of Jesus Christ, right? Okay. So now there's sin. Prior to this, Adam and Eve were running around the garden and they were not clothed. There was nothing hidden. Completely aware of themselves, completely comfortable with themselves. After sin comes into the world, they go and they hide. And God comes into the garden looking for them because he was used to walking and talking with them and he can't find them. And when they come out of hiding, what do they have on them? They're covered in fig leaves. You know what? We still wear those fig leaves. And it comes in the, the, the form of I am what I do. I am what I have. I am my performance. Those are the fig leaves. And this is the journey of saying no more of the fig leaves are coming down. I want to be able to say, see purely this is who I am. This is where I am. This is the blessing it comes with. These are the challenges it comes with. But that's okay because I can do th all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? Okay. I have just a few ground rules that I want us to go through before we get into this. And like I said, it's just because I have seen some of the damage that this can do sometimes. So I want us to make sure we're on the same page. So the first one is that your type is an opportunity. As you're going around and you're asking each other, what are you, what are you, what are you? Don't look to the left or the right and wish that you were that. Your type is an opportunity. I've had opportunity to be able to be in situations where my exact personality type is what was needed to help diffuse a situation, to help counsel a person. Your type is an opportunity. Your type is not permission. You ever know those people where they say, you know, I just say it how it is. All right, well, what you're saying may be right, but how you're saying it, it, it ain't working, right? Your type is not permission. Be cautious in typing others. As we go through the nine types, we're probably going to think of so-and-so down the street, and you might have the thought, oh my goodness, my neighbor, she is totally a seven. <laughs> okay. You may be right, but let's just slower roll a little bit before we start typing other people. It takes a lot of work just understanding our own in the first place, right? So let's be careful before we type other people. And that's one of the things that I always struggled with with personality tests because I take a questionnaire and it pops out a result and you think you know me? You don't know my story. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what I've had to struggle through. You don't know what my victories are. We haven't had a conversation. So be careful before we're too quick to type people and actually leave some space to be able to get to know them. It could be a starting point of what you think they may be, but let's have the conversations with them. Do not use someone's type against them. Okay? 
So in our family, I associate more with the type two. Um, my oldest son is more of a type six. And then my youngest son, my husband and my daughter who is here with me, um, they're type nines. They're the peacemakers, right? And so they're wanting to make sure everyone is feeling okay about the decisions. How do you think this goes after church when we're trying to decide where to go eat? <laughs> There have been times I'm ready to rip my hair out. It's not that difficult, people. It's not rocket science. I am hungry. Where are we going to go and eat, right? And so what you don't do is tell them, you're being such a type 9 right now. <laughs> because then you're making their personality type a negative. Instead of embracing the fact that their heart is that they're thinking about everyone else in the group. Embrace what's positive. So we're not going to use our types against each other. Um, and it's okay to disagree. At the end of this, you may not feel that this is a tool for you. That's totally okay. No one's going to get hurt or offended. This is not the Bible. This is not replace the Bible. This is a tool. Some tools will work for you, others will not. And that's completely okay. You may go through the descriptions of that, your particular type, and maybe not all of it totally fits. That's okay. I said I associate more with the type two, the helper. If you're on, on Instagram, you're going to see a lot of these cute little things that get people put up there with their numbers. And whenever they put the type two, the helper, they usually associate it with someone who's baking cookies and casseroles and offering to come and clean your house <laughs> that is not me <laughs> the closest I get to baking cookies is Pillsbury all right I and mean, that's just not that's not me here's what I will do though you tell me you have an interview you want me to pray for you I'm gonna put a reminder on my calendar and I'm gonna start praying for you maybe about an hour before you probably get a text where I'm gonna check on and you see how you're doing you're gonna go through your interview I'm gonna be praying for you the interview is gonna end I'm gonna gauge how maybe how long it takes give you a little bit of space to kind of come down from that and then I'm gonna text you again and say hey how did it go I'm gonna remember those things in your life I'll sit down with you we'll have a cup of coffee we'll talk through life for an hour or two help you process things so you, the way that you see things described may not hit you specifically. What you're looking for is more of the foundation of how you process and what it is that's motivating you. Okay, so we're going to get into the first one. The first one, the type one, is the reformer. Other names that it goes by is the perfectionist and the good person. This is type one. Type ones, you see how things could be. And that is amazing. You don't just see what's there in front of you. You see how it could be. You see how much better it could be. You see all the possibility. Type 1 personalities, they're the ones that they can look at something in a, in a system that is broken, something that is happening in society, an injustice, and they don't just see that, but they see the possibility of what could be, and they give their lives for that. How many people in history do you know like that? That they did that. They saw what the status quo was. They saw people who were hurting or they were hungry. And they were willing to come out of their place of comfort and to work tirelessly for what could be because they could see it so clearly. That's you. And that's amazing. And we need people like that in our lives. You tend to be more detailed oriented. You see the details. Now, it's great to have the visionaries, right? We want the vision. But how are we going to get to that until we've got some of those details worked out, right? You tend to see more of the vision. For type 1s, there is a bit of perfectionism that can run through you if we're not careful. Part of the reason that you can see what could be is because you're also seeing the flaws. You can look at a system, you can look at what's happening, and you see the flaws in that. There's nothing wrong with that. What the challenge comes in is when we get fixated on the flaws. Does that make sense? You're not much of a rule breaker. You 
tend to walk this line. You like the boundaries. Things can be a little black and white for you. You don't, you don't operate too much in the gray, but you really want to know right from wrong and you want to be able to stay on the right side of the line. That's really important for you because that's going to get you to better and you're always looking where you can get to better. And you can get a little disappointed when you feel like others are not doing their part. You work so hard for what's better. And when other people don't show up, that can be really frustrating for you. And where they feel like maybe they're doing what they need to do, or there's a reason behind why they couldn't show up, or the way they're operating, you're coming from a standpoint of like, why aren't we all working just as hard as I am? And that can become really frustrating for you. Now, here are the blessings that come with type 1 personalities. You are people that we can count on. Your yes is solid. If you say that you're going to be there, we can count on you to be there. If you say that you're going to work through a project, we can count on you that you're going to work through that project. And you're going to give it your very best in what it is that you're doing. We can count on you. Another blessing is that you do get the details and you're self-disciplined. You're going to really drive yourself. You're going to work really hard at what it is that you're doing. And you, don't, you need very little outside motivation for people to push you because you see the flaws. You see all the work that needs to happen. You see what's better and you want to work towards better. And so you are driven to work towards better. And you are disciplined in that area. Uh, ones tend to be pretty thoughtful about money as well. That makes sense. They pay attention to the details. They want to stay in a place that's right. So they can be pretty thoughtful about money. And you reflect God's goodness. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, But you are a cho chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You take this seriously. I'm reflecting God. And it's not that the rest of us don't take it seriously. You just take it to a different place. I'm reflecting God. I want to reflect his goodness as good as I can because you want to be good. You strive for that. Okay, here are some challenges that come with being a one. You can be pretty critical of yourself. That inner critic can have a pretty loud voice. Constantly telling you where you could have done better, you should have done this, it should have looked this way, if you had just given it more work, more effort, more time, if you had gone to school for another year or whatever it is, you have this inner critic that's constantly speaking to you. You may be that person where it doesn't matter how anybody else brings critique to you, you will always be more critical of yourself than someone else. And unfortunately, some of us wear that like a badge. And it's not. I know I used to do that all the time, and I was that person that would very proudly say, trust me, no one pushes me harder than me. No one is more critical of myself than me. Until I realized one day, that's actually not healthy. That's not actually really good. You can be very critical of yourself. Forgiveness can be hard. Now think of it, if you're very critical of yourself and if you're always working towards better and if you get frustrated when others aren't working as hard as you, this is where forgiveness can be hard because you're probably having a hard time being forgiving of yourself. See, a lot of times what you, what a person is doing with, to other people, they're probably struggling with that in their personal lives even worse. When you find someone who's very critical of others, their inner critic is probably screaming at them. When someone has a really hard time being forgiving of others, it's probably because they have a hard time receiving forgiveness and forgiving themselves. So forgiveness can be really hard for you. It can be hard to relax because there's always work to be done. What do you mean relax? We don't have time to relax. The world is burning down. Come on. There's work to be done. It can be really hard to relax. And you can be judgmental and critical of others. Why aren't they working as hard as I am? Why are they okay with the mediocre? It could be better. Why, are they, why is their system set up this way when there's a more efficient way to do this? You can be very judgmental and critical of other people. So here's a story um, in scripture that can give us a little bit of an example. If you look at Luke chapter 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. 
Now, this is a story about this son, this younger son who took off with his dad's inheritance, but it's not just a story about him. This is also a story about his brother and their father. And the prodigal son, the younger one, he wanted his inheritance and dad is living to a ripe old age and the inheritance is not getting there quick enough. And so he asks for the inheritance and dad gives him the inheritance and he runs off and he squanders it. And he hits rock bottom and he ends up in this pig pen, literally. And then he realizes Ah, man, I've made some mistakes. I've really messed up here. And he humbles himself and he decides to turn around and come home. And the dad runs down the pathway to greet him and embraces him and is so happy that his son is back and he tells his servants to have this feast ready for his son. The older son hears about this and what's his reaction to this? Luke 15, starting at verse 28. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. I have never neglected a command of yours. I did everything right. I followed the rules. I went ahead, I worked hard, I stayed up late, I did extra credit, I did all of this. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, I love how he did, it's, not, it's no longer his brother. When this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, dad, he broke your heart. He broke every rule in the book, and I'm pretty sure this son of yours even made up rules so he could break those too. <laughs> he was horrible. He's devoured your wealth for prosperity. You killed the fattened calf for him. Now, was the older son wrong? No, his assessment was right. The younger son, the brother, he messed up. He totally messed up. He squandered that. Who knows what that even did to the family's reputation and to their honor. That was huge. Imagine what that would do as a parent to your heart. See, he wasn't wrong in his assessment, but he was missing something. He got more caught up in the rules. He got more caught up in the flaws, and he was missing something very important. Verse 31. And the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. You've always been with me. You've had everything that I have. And you've had me. You've had my protection. You've had my love. You've had my care. You've had my counsel. You've had my warmth. You've had my affection. You've had the roof over your head. You've had all the supplies that you needed. There was never anything that he went without because everything that was the father's was his. He had all of that. And that was his father's way of celebrating him every day. Every day. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. The dad wasn't celebrating the wrongs that the other son did. The dad was celebrating the fact that the other brother, his other son, recognized the wrongs, turned, repented, and came home. And sometimes as ones, you can get caught up in the rules and in the flaws and what he could have done and what he should have done. A healthy one is going to see the details. A healthy one is going to be able to see what could be and have patience and grace with people as they come along the way. That's when you're in a healthy place that you're able to do that. Okay, so for ones, what are your core, what's your core fear? Your core fear is being flawed, is being wrong. 
You work so hard at being right. The core fear is being flawed. What's your core desire or need? It's perfection. You feel unsettled. You, you don't want to get criticized. You don't want to get called out on, on anything. So you work really hard to make sure all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted so nobody has to come and tell you that you've done something wrong or it wasn't quite up to par. That makes you very, um, very unsettled. Your core weakness or challenge, we call that our deadly sin. So each of the Enneagram types have what you would call a deadly sin. It doesn't mean that the rest of us don't struggle with that at some point. It just means that this particular type tends to struggle with it a little more and maybe a little deeper. So the core weakness or challenge here is resentment. That would be in that anger family. Resentment, and it comes from a place of frustration and disillusionment. You're looking at this everything around you, and it could be better, and you get so frustrated with people and with situations, and this resentment starts to boil up. Now, you may not necessarily see someone who's a one acting out in anger. They're just kind of gritting their teeth because they're working so hard to make this better. <laughs> but they're just frustrated. And it's that resentment that's coming in there. Your core longings is you want to be good. And we're going to talk about how to show love to someone who's a type 1. But you want to be good. You're trying and you're working so hard to be good. Now I have here, it's called a triad. And what that is is that there are nine personality types. But you can also group them into threes. And there's the, the gut, and there's the mind, and there's the heart. And the gut tends to be more about experience, actually getting in there and doing stuff. And so a one would be in that gut triad. And you really experience things by doing them and having that space. So here's some spiritual formation, some ways that we can grow spiritually. And I want to make sure I'm being aware of the time. Okay. Spiritual formation. So here are some scriptures that you can use to contemplate on. The first one, Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If as a type 1, you're constantly looking at what you can do better and you're more focused on that, then take the scripture and just really sit in this place of being able to say, well, while I was still a sinner, Christ loved me and died for me. It was not about my performance. It was not about how I aced a test or how well I did this project. In, and while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. 2 Corinthians, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Weakness is not wrong. And I know it can be hard as a type 1 to embrace that weakness. Weakness is an opportunity for God to come in and flex his muscles for you. It's okay if you're not good at something. Let him come into that. Psalm 86, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant and loving kindness to all who call upon you. You're going to mess up. On this side of heaven, no one's perfect, right? No one. You're going to mess up. You may not, it may not come out exactly the way you had hoped it was going to come out. Don't beat yourself up about that. It's okay. Okay, so here are some practices. There's downstream and there's upstream practices. Downstream practices are things that they just pre they flow pretty well with you. Okay? Upstream practices are those that it might be a little bit of a challenge for you. These may or may not totally apply. There's just a couple here just to get the wheels turning, okay? So these are some practices that you can put into place long term. So downstream practices, they flow pretty well, are meditating on God's word. Because you're wanting to know what's right and what's wrong. So meditating on God's word and truth, that could probably come pretty, pretty easily for you. My encouragement for you would be to make sure, are you doing this out of a relationship with God? Or are you doing this out of a fear of being wrong? Making things better. You feel useful when you can get in there and help to make things better. And we need that. Just ask yourself, am I doing this for the approval of God or from the approval of God? There's a difference in that. Okay, upstream practices. This could be a little challenging. Uh, journaling, things like confession and assurance. 
you journal and you write down what are some of the things that are a struggle for you where you don't feel like you're you know it's a little bit of a shortcoming maybe for you some of your insecurities that are there maybe you snapped at someone or you didn't get this quite right you'll be you're able to face this now in a healthy way and you have the context of the scripture here where it says therefore since we have a great high priest as hebrews 4 who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things is without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you're finding yourself looking at the things that, oh, I didn't quite get this, I didn't quite get this, bring it to the throne of grace. Not judgment, not condemnation. You're bringing that to the throne of grace. And then confession, you want there to be assurance after. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't quite get this right. I'm still loved. I am still good. Because I didn't ace the test does not mean I am not good. Okay, another one that could be a little hard, nature walks. Now, I just put nature walks. It could be something along the lines that's going to help to slow your pace and quiet that inner critic and connect with God. Because you're working, 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 working. What can you do to help quiet that space for you? Some daily, weekly practices that you can do. Um, pick a hobby that you're not good at and just do it for fun. Yeah, I know. That was bad. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I had to, though. I had to. Like, it's probably going to be really frustrating at the beginning, but you want to do this. Um, when our kids were younger, we were homeschooling for a number of years, and... Um, you know, my, we had, at that time, we just had our two older kids, and they were just really good in a lot of these subjects. And one of the things that my husband was, was telling me about when we were putting curriculum together, he's a school principal now, um, but he was a teacher for 12 years. He wanted us to make sure that we had our kids involved in things that were hard for them. Because what we didn't want is for them to go through their schooling um, years and then come out and be shocked that there were some things in the world that were going to be hard. While they were good at academics, that's not how the whole world is structured. So making sure that they were involved in things that were going to be hard for them and were going to be challenging. So pick a hobby that you're not good at and just do it for fun. All right, before immediately attempting to correct a wrong, ask yourself where that's coming from. Now, my husband, I said he was a teacher and for 12 years, and I would go and visit him in his classroom, you know, like a sweet, loving wife that I am. And I would go in there, and he's also very artistic, and I felt like his room was chaotic. It bothered me to no end when I would go into his room, and I would let him know on behalf of the students, of course. <laughs> And I would let him know. Now, this was way back when. Now, when I look back, I realize that had nothing to do with the students. That had everything to do with me. I'm a very clean lines kind of person. My head is constantly processing everything. It's like a computer screen. It's just moving around. So I realized that my outside world has to have clean lines. It helps to balance what's going on in my brain. And I realized that coming into his classroom looked like my brain. And I didn't want that. And so if I had understood this back then, I would have put the brakes on and asked myself, why do I feel the need to tell him there's a better way to organize his classroom? And really check myself before I started to go and bring that. Try to capture what your inner critic tells you. What is Jesus saying to this? What does scripture say about our thoughts? It says to take every thought captive, right? But here's what we tend to do. Negative thoughts come in, our inner critic comes up, and we just say, no, 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 I'm going to ignore you, I'm going to ignore you. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to ignore you. Okay, but it says to take every thought captive. How do I take something captive while I'm ignoring it at the same time? <coughs> to take something captive, it actually requires me to engage with that. So when that inner critic starts to talk, 
You listen to what the inner critic is saying, but then you take that to Jesus and you say, Jesus, what do you say about this? And that brings truth when the lie is trying to come in and now you can sit and you can meditate on that truth and you can walk out on that truth. So listen to what your inner critic is saying and take it to Jesus. Ways that we can show love to a one. Since a one can be pretty hard on themselves, we need to make sure that we come into the picture and we remind them that they are loved for who they are and that they are good. You go up to them, you say, you know what? I'm just going to pick a random name, Mary Beth. Mary Beth, I really just appreciate you as a person. And Mary Beth may be in a place right now where she is just gung-ho about this project. And Yeah, I've just been working so hard on this project and I wanted to get, oh, no, no, you've been doing a great job on this, but I, I wasn't talking about that. I was just talking about you as a person. Oh, okay. You're reminding them that they are good. They are not what they do, but that they are good and that they are loved. Another way that you can show love to them is listen to their concerns and then help them to lighten up and have some fun. Hey, you've been working on this project for seven days straight. How about we go to Universal Studios? Our family's a Universal Studios family. Let's go to Universal Studios. Uh, I have been working for seven days straight. I got to get this done. Da, 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 da. Oh my goodness, would you just lighten up? I can tell you right now that conversation is going south real fast. Instead, Ask them, okay, why is it hard for you to pull away from this right now? And listen to them. Well, if I don't get this right, people are going to think I'm letting them down, that I didn't care. Oh, okay. And then speak to that. And then say something like, hey, we know, what if we just go for like a half a day? It gives that part of your brain a little bit of a break, and then you can come back refreshed. Okay, I can do that. But you listen to them. You didn't just hear them, you listened to what they were saying and you engaged in that. Take responsibility for your part in things. Type 1's hard workers. You can count on them, but we don't want to take advantage of them. I don't want to say, well, John, he always shows up and he works hard enough for the three of us, so I'm sleeping in this Saturday morning. I'm not going. No. Just because they work hard doesn't mean we don't show up. Show up and take your responsibility for your part in things. Now, I know we're going to get ready to transition to your groups, but before we do, I just I want to give you just this imagery. I do this thing where I write these breath prayers, and they're prayers that are based on Scripture, and I just do them to the rhythm of my breathing. And it just helps me to be able to calm my body and to calm my heart. And I'm also meditating on God's word. And I just finished this book where he was talking about this prayer. And it's called Acceptance and Surrender. And I love the imagery that came with that. The acceptance part, the imagery was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where he toiled over what was about to come. But he accepted because he also knew the blessing that would come with it. And then the surrender part was Jesus on the cross when he fully surrendered. And what happened at that point of surrender? The earth shook and the court curtain was ripped from top to bottom. There was no more barrier between us and God. And death was defeated at that place of surrender. I want you just to take a moment and close your eyes. And in your own way, come into that place of being able to breathe in acceptance. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then breathe out surrender. Jesus on the cross. Accepting where you are right now, but knowing where you are is not where you're destined to stay. Accepting the beauty of how you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's okay to celebrate that. And surrendering that to Christ. Accepting the challenges that come with who you are. And surrendering that to Jesus at the foot of the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.